Right, how are you, MK? Nice to see you. Uh, let's hope we're live. Hello, everybody out there that knows me and MK. What we're doing here today is trying to talk about what we think business is going to be like when we go back on the 4th of July, God willing. Uh, I have an issue about appointments and non-appointments. Now, in my shops, I've always had non-appointments, but it looks like we're going to have to go to appointments. So I'd like to get MK's view on appointments because he's been taking appointments for 20 years. <laughs> to you, MK. Yeah, well, you know what? I, I, I couldn't see any other way of doing things, to be honest with you. The, the, um, the whole idea of doing appointments was an idea to still facilitate the customers, but to actually have a little bit more flexibility. Because, you know, I, I generally work sort of like three and a half, something maybe three to four days a week. I don't do more than four days. I have three days off always. And um, I did that just for me to be flexible. And that flexibility allowed me to sort of like, really kind of just have good conversation with my clients and find out um, when they wanted to be serviced. So if I didn't really have to start so early, I didn't start so early. So I kind of did things around the client. So to be honest, I, I think now we're, we're moving towards an age where you have to be more client driven, especially with the amount of competition that's out there. If you're looking to just do your regular nine to five or whatever, nine to six hours that everyone else is doing, and another guy, and another guy, and another guy, and another guy, how many barbers there are on the local high streets now these days are willing to stretch the, stretch the, you know, stretch it and sort of go work on until about nine o'clock. So, so you work four days a week, you work longer hours though. Do you still put in 40 hours a week? Um, I, yeah, you could say that. I, I would, I would say I'm there. Yeah, I'm there. Look, I'm there early. You know, if I start at 10, I'm there at like half eight, you know, because right. whatever I'm doing, I need to be ready for it. And um, so, yeah, the hours do you, are. Do you think taking appointments increases your ticket average? I think, I think appointments um, can allow you to control your ticket average. I think it can aid your ticket average. I do think... You, I think having that, that level of communication with your clients allows you to market to them better, which... Um, so which let's, go, let's go on to another one, okay? Most barbers, including myself, don't take credit cards, right? Now, it looks like it's going to be uh, a cashless society coming up soon. And what you take credit cards, don't you? Yeah, I, I would say now it's probably more so card than it is cash. I haven't so seen cash for a while now. What's your percentage between cards and cash? I would say it's 80, 80, 20. 80, 20. Now, the other thing that's quite interesting is because we don't take appointments, we're actually building an appointment system. Yeah. So this appointment system... What it actually does is it allows, see, Booksy and all those, they're great, but you're on a platform with everybody else, okay? And there's restaurants, there's this, there's that, and you have to go onto it to get onto Booksy. It's not your unique booking system as such. But, um, so we're building one at the moment that, it's tailored to me, so when you go onto the men's room, it will be just for the men's room. Then it will tell us which shop you want to book in. Do you want to book in at the Manchester, this one, that one, the other one? And then it goes to the stylist and everything else. So we're going to be rolling that out soon to other salons that want their own booking system, so they're not part of, say, Booksy or someone else like that, because we're promoting Booksy all the time instead of promoting ourselves. So when, yeah. I'm, so when I'm on Booksy and I'm looking for a, a barber shop in Tottenham, 
every barber shop in Tottenham that's using Booksy will come up. So I want it to be unique to me. So we're going to be tailor making these unique to salon. So if anybody's interested in your own unique web um, booking concept, uh, please get in touch because um, we're going to be launching this in about three weeks before we go back. And it's only about five pounds a week to have your own system done. So do please keep in touch. Now, the other thing that was quite interesting, uh, MK, you told me that your customers pay you when they book. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I have um, I have clients that book when they book. They're paid up when they book, sorry. And I also have clients that are on account. So they have rolling accounts. So in other words, I have clients that want the same time every week or every two weeks. And a lot of them are on account. So they pay sort of like four to eight haircuts four to eight haircuts in up in front. So that's how I do it. How does your cash flow work when that happens? Because you've got your money all in one go, and then for the next seven times, you're doing, in your head, a free haircut. No, it's not, it, it, you know, it, doesn't, it never bothers me about whether I'm doing it as a free haircut, because it, it, it makes me more disciplined to keep and stick to the time frame that you're actually doing that particular service in. And if you were ever worried about that, the best thing to do is sell a product, sell another service. Do you know what I mean? And you, and you find by taking credit cards, it helps uh, to sell other services and products and things like that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, as, especially if you're keeping the education continuous with uh, with with your uh, with your system, and you're making sure that. You know, if you've got this new product in and it does this and it does that, or you've done a particular good hairstyle where a particular you know product has worked really well, then yeah, you just put that out there and let, allow everyone to see. You got to show off your work. If you're not, if you're not a show off in this game, you're in the wrong game. Just, I don't see the point. You have to I be a show. -off. I agree with you there. So you book people in every half an hour. Yeah, generally every half an hour. There we have fifteen minute segments. Is how my um, appointment um, blocks are done, but I can change that at any given time. I can change it down to the minute if I want. I can add padding time in terms of maybe prepping the, the area prior to the next client. I can add that in automatically, or I can put it in there purposefully, manually in other words. So well, the system we're building, it, I'm going to do 20 minute appointments. So the way my system works is that I, I want to charge my service at a minimum of, of a pound a minute. So, you know, people will say to you, well, I charge 15 quid for a skin fade. I couldn't possibly do a skin fade in 15 minutes. I agree. But if you're going to do one and take 30 minutes, you've got to charge 30 quid. Then you get the argument, but where I am, uh, I'm surrounded by people that have got no money and there's not a chance in the world they'll pay 30 quid for a head. Then my argument to that is move. You know, because you put yourself in that situation. Because us as barbers, we have to charge a pound a minute. By the time you pay your VAT, if you VAT, by the time we pay the PE, this, that, and the other, you know, there's going to be no money for us. So the way that I, I'm doing it is that I'm charging a ticket average of £15 a haircut. So I'm going to book 20-minute appointments, which hopefully they'll be done in 15, some a little bit longer, some a little bit less. But we'll be working on three customers an hour. So you're working on £45 an hour. You take away the VAT, if you're going 50 50, it's a decent wage. It's 720 pounds a week, you know, which is a comfortable wage. Because what tends to happen is that most people that work in barbershops, especially if you're a man, you're married, you've got kids, you've got a mortgage, you've got car payments, you can't pay the minimum wage. So you've really got to look at how you're running your business when we go back from this. And it really interests me about the credit 
cards, and it interests me about the appointment system. But what I've learned from you, MK, is that when someone makes an appointment, I think we have to take at least 50% deposit. Because if they don't turn up, we've lost the money and we haven't been able to book anybody else in. I, 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 I just prefer, if you're going to make a commitment, just as I have to make a commitment, I have to commit to being there. I'd like you to commit to being there. It's just an agreement. You, you don't want to ever shake someone's hand and they go, well, I, I hope I hope we can do business. And you're like, well, I'd like to do business. And like, well, uh, you don't want that. You want someone that's fully in, fully vested the same way as you are. And I, I just believe, just take the full amount. If you're actually going to get a haircut and you're going to get a shave, then you pay for the haircut and the shave. If you've got any problems with that and you counsel within um, the, the time frame that we permit, then yeah, we'll refund you, no problem. But so, if you don't turn up, then we keep that because we have to, we still have to pay. That barber still wants to know that he's still getting his wage because there's no point, he doesn't want to hear that that person didn't turn up. He's like, that's not my problem. Yeah. What's your cancellation policy? Um, at the minute, we don't have to stretch it no more than three hours. Um, we, we used to do 24, but um, we found that a number of people changed. And when, what happened was, because the, the demand got higher, we could actually lower the, uh, the cancellation time because the demand was so much higher. We always had people on the waiting list. So it didn't make sense us stretching it to 24 hours when we could always fill it within three. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so let me ask you another question, uh, MK. You've been in the game a long time. You, you know, you've won every freaking award out there, you poser. And um, where do you think it's going to happen when we go back? Well, I, I, you know what? It's going to be about the ones that actually capitalise on the technology and utilise it. Because even if you just think, regardless of whether you want to believe it or not, just understand that whatever you're going to believe is based on the old paradigm where we've come from. If you haven't sat down and thought about everything that all of your clients have been doing in this time, yeah, which is actually becoming more techie, yeah, they've been forced to become more techie. Some people that have never ever booked their shopping online have been doing it every week. So, actually, you know, yeah. there's no way that you can't sort of like say to yourself, we have to get a little bit more techie, but, you know, because if you don't, the guy that's down the road and the young guys that are actually more savvy with the technology, they will take your clients quite easily. So you spend a lot of time on social media. Uh, I wouldn't say I spend a lot of time. I would say I, I, I spend as much time as I can. If I can spend more, I will. If I've got something to say, then I'll say if I haven't got nothing to say, then I'm not saying anything um, because I'm busy doing something. But if my, my main focus is generally just to appease myself in a way that I can actually see that I'm worth something to the audience that I'm appealing to. So on my training day Tuesdays, I'm appealing to those that, um, that want to learn more about barbering, those that want to better themselves in barbering. On my... Um, on my uh, WhatsApp, I'm directly appealing to my clientele. And, and on, on my Facebook page of my um, salon, I'm directly appealing to potential clients. So that's all I kind of focus on. And if, I'm, if I look at anything and I'm seeing that, okay, we're gonna need to do this, or we're wanting to go down this route, or we're needing more of this, then I look at what we're gonna need or how much it's gonna cost, and what do we have available to us right now that we need to build up more of in order to get the money to do the thing that we want to do. So then now the marketing plan now comes in place. The little step-by-step -step things, the little things that you put from, from your toilet to the front of your door, to the things you put in your email, to the things you might put in your reception area. It's all psychological from the moment that they walk in the door to the moment they leave, to the moment you pick up the phone, to the moment they get an email, to the moment you might hand them a card. What things are you doing that is pushing the narrative of where you want your business to go? And, that, that, and that's it. I, I agree. The, the, I've been giving everything. I've been an educator for many years. And I've had chains of salons. I've got a training centre. 
And like yourself, I have the opportunity to travel around the world and to see how other people work. But I'm of the conclusion now that it's not enough that we cut hair. No way. No way. Yeah. So because I'm going to give a decent haircut, you're going to give a decent haircut, the guy down the road is going to give you a decent haircut, he's going to try to give you good service, you're going to give good service, you're going to use good products, he's going to use good products, so what's going to separate us? And I think what is going to separate us is to introduce different services into our industry. Like, for example, no heard of micropigmentation on the scalp until I started it about three years ago. Now it's becoming very popular. But what we're doing is we're working on 200 to 300 pounds an hour. And what happens when a client comes in, you can convert that client. That's the way, and the salons down the road from you are not doing it yet. I was in New York a while back and I couldn't find a barbershop or a ladies' hairdressing salon that didn't offer micropigmentation. So it's only going to be a matter of time until it's absolutely going to be saturated here, where I'm working on 200, 300 pounds an hour. You can bet your life in the next three years, there's going to be our friends that are opening up everywhere doing it for 25 quid an hour, 30 quid an hour. You know, but if you pioneer it now, then that way, build a reputation. The other things that we're working on is men's uh, anti-aging creams, anti-aging night cream. One of the fastest selling products in this country is anti-aging creams on men. So I think we're all barbers and we all cut hair and we all shave. We all a good service we all give a nice environment so we have to give something else and i think micropigmentation fibroblasting anti-aging uh, non-surgical placement i think that's what we've got to concentrate on get our barbershop to the next level and where i think it's going so where i'm concentrating a lot of my time is we know how to cut hair. We look after people. We know how to make our salon look beautiful. We know how to greet a client and we know how to charge them. So I'm concentrating on what the barbers are not doing so I can add to my portfolio. But I don't want to do it for a pound a minute. I want to work on five pound a minute, 10 pound a minute. And that's where I see the industry going. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, if, you, if you've actually got yourself qualified in another area of expertise um, and you can, you can display it as such, I mean, I look at the micropigmentation. I mean, I did my course with you um, and I look at the micropigmentation as, as, a, as a means of moving down the, uh, the, how can I put it, towards the trichologist you avenue. Said, yeah. Yeah. And not that, you know, it's trichology, but I mean, I'm talking about the professionalism and the way it's conducted. So you'll be almost perceived as a, as a dentist would. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because you'll have all these clean tools, you'll have a way of working, you'll have a discipline. Now, what I like about um, adding services like that is that those types of services actually forces you to be more hygienically disciplined Absolutely. anyway. Yeah. And I think where we've where the barbers have fallen behind the hairdressers, where they've actually got these chemical services in place from the beginning of time, yeah, they were immediately forced to have a professional way about them because you're dealing with a chemical that you're applying to someone's skin. So you're dealing with the amount you're using, you're dealing with the time, you're dealing with the sensitivity, you're dealing with so many things, even down to the fact of what uh, medication they may be on. So you're already groomed in a way of having a consultation with your client just to even do your normal job. Whereas barbers didn't feel, barbers didn't feel that they had that need and they didn't have that need in, in the way that they were conducting it because there wasn't many or any chemical services. And I think the lack of chemical services or any form of intricate services 
um, takes away from the fact that you have to conduct it in a professional manner because you're getting these different products and they've got all of these instructions on it for you to apply it. So you then have to learn it. You then have to revise it, remember it. You have to then regurgitate and let the client know because there's more stages to this thing than what they can actually see. So it's really important to um, make sure that you are actually delivering a good service once you've got some form of chemical or something you have to add to the client. And what's, what's quite interesting there is that when we do micropigmentation, non-surgical facelifts, um, uh, fiber blasting, we are doing, we've been doing for years, the masks, the gloves, sanitizing everything, cleaning the chairs. We've been doing all the PPE that they're asking us to do now. Yeah, we likewise. Do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, it's quite interesting. But, you know, people keep saying, they message us and they say, <clears throat> what do you think is going to happen? What do you think? I ain't got a clue. We haven't been told. You know, a load of us went out and bought masks, a pound of pound and mask, this, that, and the other, which cost 6p normally. Yeah. Right? Now they're coming down in price. I've spent a grand just for masks. Wow. You know, it's, a, it's a disaster. But we don't know what is going to happen. We're looking at screens uh, in between each chair. Yeah. So you don't have to do the two meters. So we're having some screens manufactured at the moment. So what happens is they're perspex and they go in between chairs. So you can see right. straight through, but they're individual. So that we don't have to do the two meter rule because we've got the screens. Yeah. You, then you say to a customer, my customers, I'm telling them they have to bring in their own mask. If they don't, we won't cut their hair, but we'll sell them a mask for a pound. It's only what I've bloody paid for it, and then they can take it home. But uh, nobody really knows what is going to happen. We haven't been told. We can speculate. We can talk about it. I'm sick of hearing about it. The only good thing I'm hoping is that people start growing their hair. You can never see another fade and black. <laughs> I'm going to commit suicide. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, there's no doubt in my mind about that. I mean, I'm already gearing up for advertising a lot of longer haircuts anyway, because um, I, I, the, the thing about having longer haircuts, is it just means that you're gonna have clientele that's gonna need products to maintain it. They're gonna need tools to maintain it. They're gonna need, um, do you know what I mean? They're gonna need a maintain, maintenance system to go with that. And not only that, but it, it, it takes a little longer. There's a little bit more intricate work that goes with that. And it's just going to be a little bit of a difference, to be honest with you. And to be quite honest, it's going to be good for the professional that can use scissors. Because most barbers today, they fade and blend and they think they crack. Right? But when it comes to using scissors, they're absolutely lost. That's why we did a call called the crossover. And the crossover was for hairdressers to learn how to use clippers. And for barbers that could use clippers to learn to layer hair. And we were getting a great response. Now, we, I all over the place training people, and it's amazing. The barbers today, please, please, please use the scissors. Learn to use the scissors. Learn to use your fingers. Learn to blow dry with your fingers. Learn to put the correct product. It ain't going to be forever a fade and a bloody black. I'm going to commit suicide if I get one of those. But <laughs> I'm hoping that the hair will get longer. <coughs> so, now, I just want to talk about a couple of courses that we do. We do micropigmentation. We do courses on long hair, short hair, fading, blending. And I refuse to do them. I guess I'm going to ask the and um, and it's it's not as busy as it used to be doing the courses because every barber 
a room at the back of their barber shop, uh, all of a sudden they've got an academy. Yeah, it's happening. You know, and they haven't got a clue. You know, and if you're out there saying that you are, then I'm sorry about the point. But I am a BTCT accredited centre. I'm a City and Guilds accredited centre. I've got Matrix. I am a member of the Guilds funding agency. When you've got all them things, then you can call yourself a, a bonafide training centre. If you've gone out and won all the awards that MK's gone out and done, then you can sort of call yourself a pioneer. But, you know, these are the problems that are happening in our industry. Yeah. I've, had, I've had people come to me on a course for micropigmentation or shaving. The next day they're advertising, they're doing courses on shaving and micropigmentation. You know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> but they have this self-belief. But as soon as the longer hair starts coming in, barbers, you've got to step up the mark, you know, because you've got to learn to use them scissors, learn to use the hairdryer, learn to, and I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of stick after this, but I don't care. So these are the courses we do. My, so the other courses we do, we just got into, I'm bringing out a range of men's uh, beauty products. There's 32 products in the range. They stem from eye gels to, um, uh, to Botox creams, to stem cell creams. And in actual fact, MK, they're made in Tottenham down the road from you. Oh, wow. And I traveled the world trying to find the manufacturer. I was in Hong Kong, Cosmoprof. I was all over the place. I ended up finding them in Tottenham. <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, which was quite interesting, but that's what I'm doing. Now, I'll tell you what I'd like to do, MK. I'd like to do a course with you on cutting Afro Caribbean hair because I ain't got a freaking clue. I think I can do it, but not like you, boy. You yeah, I mean, there's, to be honest with you, there's many people that 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 um, think they can do it. Um, there's many people in my in, in, in my own circle that think they can do it as well, but uh, there's because it's not really been taught properly, or people actually haven't been taught how to teach, then even the mindset behind becoming an an even better barber um, is not there, and it's almost like a barber is just uh, he, he he's um. He gets his credit from his surroundings. So, you know, he's done Mark and Paul and John and Mark and Paul and John say he's a great hairstylist. So everyone gets Mark and Paul and John's haircut and he kind of goes for his career like that until he meets a different situation and finds out that he doesn't know as much as he thought he knew. Um, but that happens to us all at different, at different times. But when that point happens, the question is, what was, what was I missing? What was I not asking the questions of? And who, who am I going to learn from? So, but yeah, I mean, doing an Afro course with our, doing an Afro course is no problem. We do that all the time. And, you know, we, we've written the standards with sitting in guilds. Um, you know, we, we've done courses all over the, all over the gap and we're still doing them. So what would you think, what would you say is the most important thing about cutting Afro-Caribbean hair? It, it's just acknowledging, um, first that it has elasticity and it changes with each cut so it doesn't matter it, the, the difference you having a um, European hair and you're cutting it you do it you hold it up you do your club cut and that's generally the length you're going to get what the best of one to two millimeters difference between dry and wet yeah yeah going from alpha to beta there's not much difference you're going to get but in afro hair you're going to get a lot of difference so you have to you have to bear that in mind. And the difference is not going to be the same because you've got mm, 32 to 36 different hair types in Afro hair. And in European, you've only got, you've only got 12 to 16. So once you've done 12 to 16, the average barber in the European side is generally only dealing with one to probably six. And what, what would you say, uh, a lot of afro Caribbeans suffer from ingrowing hair because it curls 
their beard and they get a lot of pus and, uh, you know, ingrown hairs at the bottom of their chin. Is there a good product to use for that? Yeah, it's called, Man it's called Manny's King and you have to exfoliate with it like I do so you can be bump free like me, you know? Smooth so like how me. How do you do it? What, what do you do? What, what's the best recommendation for that? Um, really, I, I use um, my, uh, my wash, daily wash. I use my exfoliant, use my exfoliant brush, use the right um, toners. Um, and then I use um, a good collagen moisturizer and I'm good. Yeah, that's why you're so good looking. Yeah, well, you've got, you've got to look after yourself. How was your birthday the other day? Oh, day? oh my birthday was absolutely amazing, man. I, I just spent it with my lady and I spent my the other day because my son um, is the day after me and I um, spent it with him. So um, really, I just had a day chilling out in the sun and just enjoying it. How's your boy now? He's 19 now. Fantastic. You don't look old enough to have a kid that old. Yeah, well, you know what? When I shave and I look good, much better than I do now, um, he looks rough right now. He hasn't had a haircut since this started. Yeah. That's what you like. I'm determined. He wasn't said that. He even asked me, he said, Dad, on your birthday, he said, you're not going to cut my hair today. I said, no, son. You're going to help me go viral with this before and after. Just leave it alone. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're hoping to open on the floor. Uh, so I think what's going to happen is, for me, I don't know what anybody else is going to do. Um, we can speculate, but I, if I don't know, I don't want to speculate. But what I do know is that I'm going to have to open longer hours to facilitate the customers that we couldn't get in because we're doing three an hour or if we have to space out or whatever. So I presume we're going to... Uh, open number hours. I think if you don't take credit cards, you're going to lose customers to barber shops that do take credit cards because it is going to become a cashless society. I totally agree that I think you you can increase your ticket average if you take credit cards. So if a man comes in for a haircut, he's 15, 20 quid. And you say you want to shave, you probably think, well, I ain't got money on me. Got a credit card, so you know, you help. And I said, don't. And the appointment system, against my better judgment, I think we're going to have to take appointments. I was the, the only salon in the UK, which was about 25 years ago, I had a chain of 12 salons, the ladies' unisex salon called Hair UK. Now, I was the only one in England that never took appointments in Lady Sands. <laughs> and, like and then Regis brought us out, which is now Supercuts, which is now Bankcuts. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's quite interesting. I've never liked the appointment thing. And especially, I don't know about now, but I remember in the days, they'd book in bogus appointments so that they could have uh, an extra lunch hour. I, oh. I... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what? I don't mind stuff like that. You know, in the beginning, right, I have to admit, I was one of those guys that thought, oh, gosh, there's someone trying to do this, someone trying to do that. I look at every staff member that's trying it on or anyone that tries it on as a thank you. Thank you for helping me improve my business system to not allow people like you in it again. And I can see you a mile off when it happens. So for me, anyone that I work with that comes to work with me, I immediately get them on helping build the system of the business, which is to get it written down. Get it written so, down. Okay, so when you, you work on your own, don't you? Yeah, I've got, I've got um, part-timers with me as well. Okay, so with a part-timer or a member of staff, how do you pay them? Do you put them on a commission, put them on a percentage, do you pay them a basic wage? How does yeah. it work? I would pay basic and then commission. You'd pay what? Pay basic wage, minimum wage, and then commission. And what is the commission based? You it's based on it's based on the criteria of where we situate you at in terms of how good your haircuts are 
and how and the speed whether you can deliver the haircut on time. So it's all about the standards and the timing. Standards and timing is key. Yeah, it's a, but it's got to be on turnover as well. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, of, of course it's always on turnover. But if you're in timing, the timing is the turnover. <laughs> so you the expect, timing... So how long do you expect someone to do a haircut? In? I'm not talking about a complicated Afro Caribbean haircut. I'm talking about a European guy comes in, wants to grade two back and sides, right? Finger cut on top, style the bit. How long will it take you? How long's the top though? Well, I'm freaking no, stop being complicated. That, well, that, 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 that all boils down to it because that's why, yeah, that's why he's we don't, great, everyone he's else is quite, everyone else is quite basic. We're not, we're not that way inclined. We don't do it that way. We, we, we let people know that there's a, there is a starting price. But when you come in and we've had a discussion with you about what you're doing, then there's a new price based on what work needs to be done. There is a basic for everything. But when you're needing, if someone comes in and says they want this haircut, and then we find out you've got some thinning going on there, you've got a a a, 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 a women, uh, crown that's sticking up like Mr. Majika, then you've got um other other areas that, and you want all this technique and this movement and this blow dry. Like, come on, if we're using more than three techniques on your hair on your hairstyle, plus having to blow dry it, it's not the same as what it might be depicted on the menu as a short back and side number two. Two back and sides, finger cut on top, you know. Yeah, then I want, it, I want it done in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. And how much would you charge for that? From 20 quid, 20, 25 pounds, depending on what they're doing. Or right. depending on yeah. the, the... Perfect. But yeah, but it's about that. It'll be around 25. I mean, our minimum cut is 25 quid anyway. Um, right. And that goes up to about 45 quid. And then when you add in other bits to it, then that, yeah. But it's from 25 to 45 quid for a normal haircut. But if you're charging 45 quid, you'll be with him for how long? Just over half an hour. Just over half hour. Just over half an hour. See, what happens is you're at the top end of the market where you can demand that. But you can demand that because of your pedigree and what you've done. Now, there isn't many people like you out there, you know, so we've got to look at the mass. I couldn't wrap my business around your philosophy because I haven't done what you've done. I'm more for the mass. So I can't charge a customer to come in and I'm doing a 20 minute haircut and I'm charging 25, 30 quid. I'd have to if I was in London. Because of the rents and the rates. Yeah. You know, not not that you pay any. I'm good. I own my premises. I'm good. <laughs> that that's why you can work four days a week. Yeah, well, you know what? You you make your bed in it, you lie in it. That's true, that's true, that's very true. So um where you know we've talked about where we think it's going. I think social media is important. I personally have a PR agent. And if you see us uh, around everywhere, it's because of the good work that my PR agent does for me. And they're called Zeus. And they're based in Manchester. So anybody wants to get hold of them, that's who you go, need to go and see Anthea at Zeus. And she will get you out there and get you known. Um, and I think more and more of that is needed today. You know, I'm getting into the beauty industry uh, and aesthetics involved with barbers, but I've learned one thing in the beauty industry and aesthetics industry. It's not about advertising because you could advertise this cream being fantastic. There's a different way now. When you do beauty products, you have to have bloggers. You have to have people doing PR for you. And people read about the products and they want to try. If you've got a page saying, buy this, because it does this down the other, so what? But if you've got another page and it's saying, 
Susie from fucking wherever uses this and she thinks it's great and there's people blogging it. You're not selling it, you're educating. Yeah, I, I agree. And that, that's what it's about. And that's what it's about. And I think, you know, if you turn around and say, I know it's very expensive to get a PR agent and they, it's blood and they bend you over and all that. But, <laughs> No, surely it's not that bad. I thought you would have liked something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it's worth it in the end. You don't seem to think you're getting anything out of it, but you do. So if you're a business, you think that you can go out there. I mean, we had a half page in the Sunday Times. We had a half page in the Mirror. We had... Uh, you know, that half page in the Sunday Times would have cost us about 12 grand to 20 grand. We got it for nothing because of the relationship that a PR agent has with these magazines. You see, and this is where you score. You know, most magazines that we're in, we don't pay, but we pay the agents to build a reputation for us. And also, don't forget, most of these magazines, newspapers, they want your story. Because imagine bringing out a newspaper every day, how much information and storage you have to come by. So the PR agents are keeping fed. Yeah. So it's very important. Don't look at it as it's a load of money for nothing. Because I don't advertise. But what I do is I pay a PR agent he gets me in places that I can't get in because I can I can Sunday times and say, can you do a half page spread on me on micropigmentation? They'll say, yeah, 20 grand. You know, so it's the stories. They they write it in such a different way. So we're just on with now. I'm just about to open a new shop. So what do we do? And this is what other barbers, head musicians to think about. When you open a new salon, employ a PR agent. Because what the PR agent do, will send out press releases, right? And they're not adverts, they're press releases. And what happens is it's news. So they'll go out and send it to everybody. And it's amazing how many people will publish that. You know, because they're looking for stories all the time. We don't know where to send it. We don't know the editors to send it to. We don't know these people, right? But that's their job, to do that. And if you look at any successful business, salons, anything like that, they've all got PR agents helping them to promote it. The other thing I wanted to say before, you know, we knock this on the head, is that when you build a pyramid, okay, you've got three parts. You've got the bottom end, the middle end, and you've got the top end. Unfortunately, the top end is only 20% of the population. Okay, so when we open a barbershop, or we say to ourselves, who do we want to cater for? Do we want to cater for the 80% of the population, or do we want to cater for the 20% of the population. And our mind, our expertise as such, tells us we're better off attacking the 80% of the population than the 20% of the population. But unfortunately, the 20% of the population spend 80% of the marketplace. And that's fact. And if you if you have a look at all the businesses that are closing down, going bankrupt, not doing well, where are they? They're all in the 80%. When you look at Versace, Gucci, Murphy, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, Ferrari, uh, Porsche, Aston Martin, Welcome, they're all in the top 20%. And they're doing well. Mm. You know, so when you price yourself, in a barbershop, aim for the top 20%, because the top 20% spend 80% of the marketplace. 
But what you can't do is that a Ford Fiesta, a Rolls Royce price. And you can't sell a Rolls Royce at Ford Fiesta prices. And the other thing that's quite interesting, which is changing, and I'm glad about it, is the people, they do up their barbershops. And what they do is they, <coughs> I'm going to get a couple of second-hand uh, barber chairs, a couple of second-hand mirrors, and I'm going to get some beaten-up furniture, and then I'm going to put some baseball bats up and some skateboards, and this I like, spend 20 quid, right? And then all of a sudden it's vintage and trendy. That bubbles burst. People want a bit of elegance. You know, if you look at if you look at uh, Chanel, Chanel in London has never had a refit in 25 years. Why? Because it's stainless steel and glass. It never goes in fashion, never comes out of fashion. It's classic. A well-cut suit. Right? It doesn't matter whether it was made in the 1920s or the year 2000, the cut is the same. Have you ever seen a girl wear a pencil skirt? A pencil skirt on a girl with a body is beauty. Okay? That was invented in the 20s. That cut has never changed. The only thing that's changed is the material and the colors. Yeah. But the cut is classic. Yeah. You know, and I'm glad we're coming out of that grunge. I mean, I see photographs in these magazines with these guys with baseball bat and that. We're barbers, for God's sake. What are we going to do? Beat you up when you come in? <laughs> it's right. You know, it's not you know what? It, 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 takes all, it takes all sorts. And the good thing about, the one good thing about um, this industry and the fact and I'm not an advocate of this in no way, shape, or form. But there is a there is a there is a silver lining in the fact that we're not a regulated um, industry. Is the fact that you get spawns of of brilliance that come from it because they've got the freedom of expression. Absolutely. You're not so you're not so rigid and kept in this little box, um, which is why which is probably why this country is probably one of the leading. Uh, places in the world for hairstyling in itself. I know? agree with you totally. Um, See, but that doesn't that doesn't dispute the fact that not having it means that there's a lot of rogues <laughs> going oh, around yeah. there with going but around with baseball if, bats. <laughs> if you go back to the punk rock days, remember the punk rockers and they yeah. had all different colours in their hair. Well, what the hairdressing industry did, which was quite clever, was that. They took that style and they diluted it and made it mainstream. Yeah. So if you go and have your hair coloured now, if a woman goes into a lady's hairdressing salon, has their hair coloured, they never use one colour. They use, like, I remember when I used to do highlights, I used to use a copper, a gold, uh, and a red to get that platinum blonde look. Mm. But that came from the punk rock days. If you go to a fashion shop and you see some of these uh, dustbins and things like that they're wearing, no one's going to go and buy that. But what the fashion industry does is tames it and make it mainstream. And that's what we do. But that style, it, what we've done in barbering, barbering has gone back, but what's happened is the expertise in the barber hasn't followed with it. Without sounding back, what I'm trying to say is a lot of barbers can get away with just doing fades and blends and have a successful business, right? But ask them to color hair, ask them to layer hair, cross graduation, uh, ask them to do, uh, you know, a box cut, this, that, and the other, even a wedge, a page boy, things like that. They wouldn't know how to. And this is where our industry is falling over. Because if a young kid come into you and said, can I have a page boy, please? Well, they wouldn't have a clue. Mm, yeah. We do. We know how to do that. You know, can I have a perm? 
A lot of stars now. Fades and blends at the side. The top, they want it permanent. Barbers are not permanent. There's a few of us. You know, I'm not saying everybody's like that. There's a lot of bloody good barbers out there. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of young lads that 18, 19, that can fade and blend a damn sight better than me. Because when you can get three people and teach them all how to draw a tree. So I teach you to draw a tree, you to draw a tree, and you to draw a tree. You will all draw me a tree. But your tree might be better than his tree. His tree might be better than his tree. But in your opinion, his tree's the best. But in my opinion, his tree's the best. And that's yeah. where, where we are in our industry. Yeah. But it's a great industry to be in, man. Oh yeah, and it's it's down to the uh, it's down to your artistic flair and your imagination to how good you become. I mean, I train people, and I'm right into training. Doesn't mean to say I'm the best barber in the world. I'm nowhere near the best barber in the world, but I can train you to become one of the best barbers. It's like Alex Ferguson; he can go and play a game of football. He was the best trainer in the world. Yeah. You know, so you've got to understand it. But I would like to see our industry become more of an all-round where you can colour, you can perm, you can layer, you can do a page boy, you can do a fade and a blend, you can do all the whole tools. At the moment, I find when I go around training, most people in their toolbox, they've got two tools. Yeah, well, you know what? That's why That's why right now, you know, even right now, I've, I'm running a petition for everyone to get behind it and um, push it towards your clients to say that we would like to have qualified barbers doing our hair and get it get public driven. Because um, really and truly, you know, for years it's been driven by the hairdresser, but I think we need more than the hairdresser and the barber now. We need public opinion. And it's I a, think to drive that it, narrative would actually allow people to then want to step it up. Now, we're, I'm offering training. I'm doing training day Tuesdays, every Tuesday, discussing um, all manner and aspects of barbering. Please just put in your questions, throw your questions in. If you want me to do stuff when the lockdown's done, we'll do it, we'll demonstrate it, we'll put it out there and we'll let people know what's going on. And we're also going to be doing online courses so definitely watch the space follow me master barber mk and you get to find out everything that there is to know in barbering and whatever have you because you know i'm part of the industry i'm in sitting in guilds barber council um have you, you name it all the sort of the things that we need to know about where the industry is moving forward i like to keep abreast of everything that's going on so yeah but that's what separates you and charging 30 quid the haircut to somebody else that just does a fade and a blend. Well, I'm, I'm putting the effort in. I'm putting the effort Absolutely. in. I'm, I'm, bring, I'm bringing the latest products, the best tools, the, the, the best environment. Um, I'm making changes all the time. Nothing stays the same here. And not only that, you and me are willing to learn. We keep Oh yeah, going. all the time. I mean, you came to me, I'll come to you. We go everywhere to learn. But unfortunately, a lot of people in our industry, they think they've reached the top and they can do everything and they're not willing to learn. Yeah. I, I mean, to be honest with you, 80% of the people in courses over the years have been women. Yes. The, the, I women, <laughs> the women are the serious ones. This is why I like to work around women because women are serious. When, they, when they've got their mind fixed, they're serious. So it's... Um, <laughs> The other thing that's quite interesting, MK, when I do my micropigmentation, when I go and do uh, shows, right, I'm not doing barber shows anymore or hairdressing shows uh, marketing my micropigmentation. Because barbers, nah, nah, it's no good, it's this, it's that. I do all the beauty shows and they reinvest in themselves. Yeah, they do. Spend the money. You go to a barber and say it's three grand for a course, but you can earn two grand a client. Ah, nah, bullshit. It's crap. It's this. It's that. 
you sit down with a girl or a, a lady that's got a business and say to them, listen, love, this is what you can do. They get it straight away and they reinvest. Yeah. You, you have to reinvest. I've just done a sell on that, you know, and it's cost me blood. Because, you know, I've got brand new Sakara on one chair. The first thing I did was have them recovered in a more luxurious flavor. I didn't have to do that. But I had it done. I had it done because I want to give my clients the best they possibly can. You know, it's like saying, I'm only going to buy a couple of second-hand chairs, second-hand mirrors, but when I get busy, and when I start making some money, then I'll upgrade. But hold on, I'm a customer. I don't want to wait until you make some money. I want to sit in a nice chair now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And yeah. I, it's been emotional, man. Definitely, it's been great, man. Thanks for having me. I Thanks know, for having me. Always good to talk to you. I can't wait till the lockdown's done. We can have a, a good drink and a chin wag and uh, see what we can do. No, no, I'm in them in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'll give you a shout and we'll hook up. Oh, okay, good. Uh, thank you very much if anybody's watching. And uh, we'll try to do something like this in the next couple of weeks. If you've got any ideas, anything you'd like us to talk about, please get in touch. If you want to be involved in our next one, please get in touch. As many people that can get involved and we can swap ideas, swap opinions, and we can learn off one another. That's what it's all about, is learning off each other. And there's no one better than my man MK to teach certain things. But not my pigmentation, I'm the man for that. <laughs> Stay light, buddy. All take right, care. you take care, pal. See ya. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.